JC, thank you very much as we uh, get Advent started. Uh, one thing before we jump into today's message, uh, this is kind of a continuation from last week, uh, but we did a, uh, a spiritual uh, kind of assessment where we wanted you guys to let us know how you were doing in certain things. Uh, this is for January, so this is kind of a preemptive thing. In January, we'll be doing a series called Abide. Um, but you, up on the screen, you're going to see a uh, QR code. If you were not here last week, I would really, really appreciate it if you would take out your phone and... And scan this right here. And all you gotta do is if you have a, uh, an Apple phone, I don't know how Androids work, uh, but Apple phone, just t- literally do that. It'll take you to the website. It'll, lit- it'll take you 90 seconds, maybe two minutes uh, to answer some really, really quick questions. My goal was to get 200. Last week, listen, we got 170, all right? So I need a minimum of at least three, 30 of you guys. Uh, and we've already learned a lot. Um, just you guys are in the word. Um, you guys uh, are doing amazing job praying. Uh, so what we're doing is all the things that we're going to learn in this is going to come uh, into play in, Jan- in January. So if you didn't take this, if you would just take a few minutes to go ahead and do that today, or look on the capstone corner, or go back. Uh, so we're going to keep doing this for a few more weeks, and this is going to help me shape specifically our discipleship series in January for that. So uh, we're kind of into the year at that. All right, so as uh, you heard JC say, uh, it is uh, the time of Advent. And so one of the things that we started last year was we gave, started giving out ornaments. So last year was Behold. Uh, if you, I think there might be a few more left over from first service for last year. Uh, but if you want the complete set of two, uh, you can go ahead, and you weren't here last year, uh, you can grab last year's. Uh, Behold, this year's Make Room. So the idea with this is that we, we pray that as years go on in five, ten, maybe 15 years, you can look at your Christmas tree and you can say, oh yeah, that was my, that was when I learned this, that Christmas, or this was that series that taught me this. And so again, that we always want to give you what we call little spiritual mile markers along the way in your journey with Christ. And so for some of you, this, this is where we became Christ followers, or this is where we began to get engaged at Capstone. But really beginning to use these ornaments as a way, as, as spiritual mile markers uh, over the holiday season. So if you didn't grab one of those, you can grab a uh, one at the, uh, as you leave. Um, again, the idea this week is make, this year is make room. So make room. When I say that at Christmas, you, a lot of times we go, well, we'll make room in the bonus uh, because we've got all those toys that are going to come. So let's go ahead and make room uh, for the new p- toys that are going to come come in this Christmas. Or uh, we need to make room in our closet because I'm going to get that sweater or that jacket or those pants. We're going to get some new clothes. So we need to make room. Uh, Goodwill, the geniuses that they are, already started showing p- old people, uh, people coming out with old stuff and putting new stuff in. Uh, so make room in our closet or in the garage. I need to make room in the garage for that new toy or that new bike or that new gadget uh, that we need to make room. So kind of here's our goal for the next four weeks is that we shift the way that we think about the the term make room. Because a lot of times at Christmas we think about making room for our stuff. But what this series is about is not our stuff but our Savior. How do we make room in the hustle and bustle of all the things that are going on uh, in the next four weeks? Are we making sure that we make room for Christ? Because Christ says, and we, and we just heard it, uh, we saw it on the, um, on the bumper video of, of, bring to me all of you who are weary. Bring to me all of you who are tired. And so the idea is that, man, we get in the hustle and bustle of all the things of Christmas, and a lot of times we don't make room for Christ. So what we're going to do is, uh, for the next four weeks, is let's take characters from the original first Christmas story. And we're going to say, hey, how did they make room for Christ that very first Christmas? And it didn't only just change their lives, but really changed the world. And I really don't believe it's any different for us that if we do the same as Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the innkeeper, that if we do the same thing of making room for Jesus, that not only our lives will be changed, but the world around us will be changed as well. And so that's kind of where we're going throughout this whole uh, month is the idea of Advent being a season where we really focus on, hey, how are we making room for Christ? Now, I've used this word Advent, and you heard, uh, you heard JC talk about Advent, and we talked about, and John Paul mentioned, and this candle of hope. So what is Advent? Because every year someone always says, I grew up in church, but no one really explained Advent, or the denomination you grew up, you may have not understood Advent, or uh, it's never been explained, or you might be new to church, which we're so glad you're here. We never, we always want people who are new to church and have never really maybe hung out at church at Christmas. 
So Advent, uh, the definition of Advent is simply this. It's the idea uh, of someone, uh, arrival of a notable person, event, or thing. The arrival of a notable person, event, or thing. And so what the early church fathers did was they created this basically Advent, what we call calendar. And each Sunday of the four Sundays leading up to uh, Christmas is reminders of who Christ is and what he came to bring for us. Now the thing about Christmas is that we got to remember is that it is one of the most holy and sacred times of, uh, of the Christian calendar of Christ's coming. But also it's one of the most secular times of consumerism and selfishness. And these two, these two things collide and enter together in the world. And so as Christ followers, we need to focus more on the holy than the consumerism. And it's kind of hard sometimes if we're really, really honest. Man, Amazon, Target, Walmart, they're sending those catalogs to our house. Man, my kids sleep with those things, circling everything that they want. But the idea of, of how do we focus not on the things of what we want, but who we have in Jesus. And that's what Advent is about. So today we heard uh, about hope, and we're going to talk about hope. And next week will be peace, and the third week will be joy, and then light of love, and then on Christmas Eve, we hope you'll be here for one of our three Christmas services, but we'll talk about light, and how Christ came to be the light of the world, and focus on the sacredness and holiness of Christmas. That's what Advent is about, preparing our hearts. That's what tonight will be about. So tonight, we invite you to come. We're going to sing songs. We're going to pray. We're going to carry communion, do communion together, share scripture. But it's really just a time to prepare our hearts for what's coming. The expectant waiting of Christ, just not the first time, but remember, prophecy became history. So what was prophesied thousands of years before Jesus ever came became our history because we now see it. In Jesus' second coming, this prophecy also will become history as well. So we'll be worshiping tonight. I hope you'll be able to join us at 630. So today we've lit the candle of hope and and many of you would agree that uh, our world is in need of hope. There's so much hopelessness out there and we, we, we hear the stories of brokenness and darkness And to be honest, it wasn't much different 2,000 years ago. That it had been 400 years since God had spoken. That there had been this silence. There had been this break between the Old Testament, the the last book of the Old Testament, to what begins now, this new chapter. And so it breaks through the silence of of an angel coming and talking to Zechariah and Elizabeth of a promised child of a very elderly couple. But then also a, an angel coming and talking to Mary and, and saying that she would uh, that she would be born of a child that she would have a child and ultimately that the hope that Sarah had hoped that she would have a child but she, it never came and that Mary hoped that one day she would have a child but God would use their two hopes together of one that thought had passed and one that was the future God would bring these two hopes together to transform the world forever. So we're going to be starting in Luke uh, 1, uh, verse 26. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you. If you don't, you can follow along on the screen. If you have your phone, I encourage you to open that up. If you don't have a Bible, I was reminded, I used to do this a long time ago, and I, I kind of got away from it. But if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. If you stop by the bridge, uh, we'd love to give you a free gift. Um, if you need a Bible, please let us know. Uh, we'd love to give that to you. All right, so Luke 1, verse 26 through 33, pretty big chunk of scripture, familiar if you've heard the Christmas story, uh, but let's see, uh, and we're specifically targeting on Mary today, and today's title is Mary's Plans. So Mary's Plans. So this is what it says in verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. (laughs) But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So here we see Mary is set to marry Joseph. 
And she's got her inspiration board all out. She's got her, uh, she's got her not a website with a registry all good to go. They've gone to Target and Amazon and they've, they, you know, they've done the scanner. They've, they've got the uh, caterer. Uh, they've sent out the save the dates. And I don't know what the save the date of Mary and Joseph look like. Maybe they were splashing each other by the Sea of Galilee or skipping rocks. Um, I don't know what theirs look like. Luckily, that was before me and Beth. We didn't have to do that 18 years ago. But I'm sure 2,000 years ago, this is what they did. But they had, they had sent out all the information. They had sent the invitations. They were ready to be married. And then, then in a moment, Mary is presented with this, <laughs> this angel. And she's startled and she jumps and he says, hey, don't worry. Don't fear that, that God is with you. He, he's found favor with you. And, and Mary begins to kind of process what Gabriel is saying. Gabriel says, you're going to have a child. And he begins to say, this is what his name will be, Jesus. And that who he will, who he will uh, be and, and what he will do. And that he will be from the line of David. And all these things that, that, that Gabriel begins to tell Mary. And we're not really sure the distance or time between uh, verse 33 and 34. Because Mary just kind of processes it. And we don't know if she's kind of, there's an awkward silence. And Gabriel's like, do I talk, not talk? Like, do I give you a hug? Like, I don't really know what to do right here. So whether there was an awkward talk between verse 33 and 34, or, or she just jumps out and, and says it. And, and this is what she says in verse 34. She's like, how can this be? I am, says I am a virgin. So she smiles and says, no, 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 you must have had the other house, the other Mary down the road, because the, I, this can't be possible. And Gabriel smiles and says, well, here's what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born and will be called holy. This is important. Will be called holy. And the Son of God, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son in the sixth month. And with her, she will be, and she, for she was barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. That's really important. And this next one, this is kind of what we're calling the make room statement. So this is how we know that Mary is willing to make room for God's plans over her own plans. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So Mary says, nope, sorry, that can't be. I'm a virgin. Gabriel says, well, here's what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to come in you. And the Holy Spirit is going to plant the seed of a child. Now, the thing about Jesus being, being conceived in the old-fashioned way is, is that Jesus had to be holy. He had to be perfect. He couldn't be with sin. And so all of us that were conceived the natural way, the old-fashioned way, we all are born as sinners because we are born, as two, b born between two, a man and a female, and they are sinners. And they create, guess what? Really good sinners. Just hang out with the two-year-old. You will really know what a good sinner looks like, all right? Right, that we create great sinners, but Jesus was different. And that's, what, that's why it's important to know that the Holy Spirit is the one who that seed is planted in Mary because Christ had to be holy. He had to be different. He had to be set apart. He had to be perfect. And that's where the Holy Spirit says, this is what's going to happen. That he will, be, he, he will continue to work through you. He says, you're going, I'm going, God is going to do the impossible. And just to kind of let you show, to tell you that, Elizabeth, your really, 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 really old cousin, guess what? She's pregnant. And Mary says, get out of here. There's no way. She's way too old. And he's like, well, go check her out. She's got a little baby. She's got a six-month bump on her. Like, what? No way. Yeah. So, so she, you thought that's an impre impressive? What's well, going to be used even more impressive because I'm going to show you that God is going to do what he's always been doing. From Genesis all the way now to the start of Luke, he's going to continue to do what God has always done, which is the impossible. And ultimately to our story that he's going to make us clean. That is impossible. Because we are sinners and it was only through Christ that we are saved. Only through Christ that we are restored. And so he says, look, I'm going to do the impossible. And then Mary says, all right. I'm, your, I'm the Lord's servant, so I'm going to accept the invitation. So this invitation was given to say, hey, will you be the mother? Will, will you choose this? And Mary says, yes. Mary says, yes, I will make room. So Mary's like, I had all these plans. We've got the, the wedding day picked out. We, we've got the perfect caterer. We've got the place to, to get married. We've, we've got all these things. 
But I'm willing to put aside my plans for the plans of God. So we begin to ask this question. Mary had her life planned out. She had her expectations of what life would look like. Yet in a moment, all that changed. The opportunity was given and she responds. So here's the question for you. If God was to reveal himself to you, and it might be through an angel. I believe in angels. But it might be through a really good sermon from a preacher. Not named me. So just listen. So maybe another, you're listening to somebody else and, and you hear a really good word. And, and, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, you need to hear that. You need to be obedient. It might be in a song or it might be in a prayer time. It may be through journaling. It might be through a conversation in community group. But it may be that God specifically, and you know it, that there's no other way. It's not your opinion, but it is, you know that it is God who is speaking to you. If he was to say, hey, I want you to do something, but it doesn't go along with your plans, what would your response be? Would you ignore it? Would you bury it? What would you do? Would you make room in your life for plans from the Lord that don't match up with your expectations, with your plans, with what you desire? We have a saying here at Capstone, and we, we experience it a lot, is this, is that the gospel is never convenient. So normally, if we've got something planned that someone will show up and they'll need some help, opportunity for us to share the gospel. The idea that when we are called to go serve or help someone, maybe in a tragedy, that is never convenient. The gospel is never convenient in the way that we share the gospel and put it on display. And Jesus told us that. Jesus said, hey, you guys need to know that the gospel is going to cost you something. The gospel is going to, you're going to have to risk some things. You're going to have to sacrifice. So we really shouldn't be surprised when Jesus says, hey, I know you've got these plans, but here's what I've got planned for you. Here's what I want you to do. Here's the place I want you to go. Here's where I want you to do you to be a missionary where you work, learn, live, and play. And so the idea that the gospel is not convenient and that we shouldn't be really surprised that when God's plans may not align with what we quote unquote think we want to do with our lives. You're like, well, is that in the Bible? Yeah, let's read. James 4. And I remember, um, I remember when I read this scripture and many, many years ago, and when I was thinking about this this doing this series, this, this is what came up when I specifically talk about Mary and her plans. So this is what it says in James 4 verse 13. It says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. He's saying, look, you say you're going to do this and you say you're going to do that and you're going to start this business and you're going to do these things. He says, yet you don't even know what tomorrow will bring. Do you realize your life isn't as big as you think? It's not as long he says, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanish. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, <laughs> let's go. We will live and we will do that, or this. And it is. You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. You, who, so, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him is a sin. So this is what we see. So uh, we see, first of all, Mary was the mother of not only Jesus, but James. So this is Jesus' little brother and Mary's son. And it's very similar to the conversation Gabriel has with Mary many years ago. It's the idea that will you make room for what God has in store for your plans, even though that's not what you thought. That he interrupts your life. The idea that he literally was split time in half. And that's what Jesus does when he comes that his birth literally splits time in half. That when we meet Jesus, that there are things in our lives that are not going to stay the same. And we work really hard at making plans and making money and how we're going to spend that money. But James says, hey, don't you understand? You're never promised tomorrow. You have all these great goals and great things that you want to succeed. But you know who's the center of that? You. You should take each day frame by frame. And as you do that, ask this question. What does God want to do with me today? How can I make much of his name? How can I bring him glory through what I say and through what I do? So here's three things of when we do that of, of what we're going to gain. First is you're going to have a greater purpose. A greater purpose. So Mary never really thought she probably was going to make much of an impact. She thought she was going to live in this little town of Nazareth, which wasn't more than a few hundred people. If you're in high school, it's probably as big as your high school class, your freshman class, your senior class. It was a few hundred people. So 
So Mary thought, there's no way I'm going to have much of an impact. So I'm just going to live a mundane life. I want to be a faithful wife. I want to be a good mother. I want to be an authentic worshiper of the God of Israel. Like, I want to do those things. No one will mention my name outside of Nazareth, let alone past my generation. Yet here we are 2,000 years later still talking about Mary. Why? Because she made room. That she had these plans, that she had these dreams, that she had these things that she wanted to accomplish. But she's like, this won't be much impact. There won't be anything that I'll do that'll transform the world. And then Gabriel showed up. And she answered, yes. Was she scared? Yes. Did she knew what the future hold, held? Not really. But she answered that. And she, with courage, made room for Jesus. So here's the question. Because I believe the same is true, that you may not think you have much purpose, or your purpose might be wrapped around the wrong things. But what if your purpose was focused on something that was much bigger and greater than you? And if God said, hey, make room for me, that Jesus wants to work in and through you. And sometimes making room isn't just getting rid of stuff. Like, well, I need to stop doing things. Sometimes it's making room in order that you can spend time more in prayer. Sometimes it is making room so that you can spend time in Scripture. For sometimes it's a mission. So 10 years ago, we made room in our life to become foster parents. And that wasn't a part of the plan. But the idea that we made room because we felt like God called us to do that. And that it, you, you go on a mission and the call and that purpose. So how are those words of James echoing in your heart? That you're not certain of tomorrow. You're not certain of what's going to come. Matthew 6, and 34. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For today has enough trouble of its own. So each day, how are we making room for Christ? Next, greater impact. Verse 15 says uh, that you shouldn't be, live on our will, but God's plan. God, if it's your will, then let's do it. Every day we should wake up and not go, okay, God, well, this is what we do. We wake up and go, okay, here's what I've got to do. Here are things that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing. And our list of what we're going to do. And we go, okay, God, is this good? Like, I'm not being a bad person, but here are the things I'm going to do. Versus, go, okay, God, what is it that you want me to do today? As a student at school or on that team or in that plan, or on that hall, or in that uh, emergency room that you're working as, wherever it may be, you say, God, I'm going to work today, or God, how are you going to use me, and what is it that I can do to benefit you? Because as we do that, we see this greater impact. Then the impact isn't based on what we get done during the day, but what Christ wants to do in and through us in the day. And can you imagine it, the people around you, how they would be different and transformed if you did that? If you woke up every day thinking not about me, but he, and how you could share his love and his grace and his forgiveness, his generosity. Now imagine this, if not only you did that, but the billion of people who say around the world, that's what they live for. And they actually lived for Christ and woke up in the day saying, okay, today is not about me, but about you. All right, God, what is it that you want to do in and through me? And I'm willing to make room, even if it's inconvenient. Even if I don't get everything done on my to-do list, even if I've, I've got to sacrifice some things, I'm willing to do that because, God, I'm not promised tomorrow, and I want to make you smile by what I say and what I do, and I want to make an impact for your glory, not mine. The world will look much, much different. Instead of what many of us do, we sprinkle a little Jesus here, and we sprinkle a little Jesus there, and, and maybe even some of you started coming back to church because it's Christmas, because that's what you do, and we're so glad that you're here, but we want to say that God has a greater impact for you, that he wants something more than just sprinkling a little bit of Jesus in your life, but truly making an impact for his kingdom and his glory. This Christmas, the idea that, uh, that you have an opportunity to, to impact others, like on your spiritual assessments, I mentioned this last week, so I started looking at some of the numbers that uh, of the 170 something people who filled it out, that over half of you came to Capstone because someone invited you. Someone invested in you. Someone told you about what was happening at Capstone, or they told you about an event, or they told you about what was happening, and you accepted that invitation. And some of you, that rescued your marriages. For some of you, it gave you hope that you didn't know because you were so hopeless. For some of you, it gave you community to be able to grieve at the loss of a loved one. For some of you, but it came because someone invited you because you made it, they made an impact on you because they just weren't thinking about themselves. They were thinking about him. 
And we know within a, a three-mile radius, there's ten to 15,000 people who don't know Jesus. So how can you this Christmas invite someone to the Christmas parade and, and sit with them and, and share when the, Chris, when the Capstone Kids float goes by of what Capstone's doing or in, invite them to the gingerbread bash that's going to be happening in a couple weeks with our Capstone Kids and maybe there's some neighbors you can invite. We mentioned Christmas Eve. That is one of the greatest opportunities of people, again, secular and sacred, come together. And Christmas Eve is a holy night. Even for people who don't believe in Jesus, there's something there. The Spirit works. So we've done three services because I am praying that we would have over 500 people that would be able to hear, see, and experience the gospel on Christmas Eve. Would you be willing to make that invitation? Would you be willing to make that impact? Again, not for your glory, but for his, which leads to the last one. Greater testimony. So we have a greater purpose that it's not about my life, but his. A greater impact that, again, that I'm able to help and serve. But the last is the testimony. Because he says, look, you boast in your plans, you boast in your strength, you boast in your success. But when we put our plans aside and we go with God's plans, we're not boasting in ourselves, we're boasting in his plans because it was his, not mine. You know, one of the things that, you, that I get to boast in is, is this. First of all, this wasn't my plan. When I was at architecture school learning how to design buildings, I didn't go, man, how can I do an amazing Christmas series called Make Room? That's not what I was thinking. I was thinking, hey, how can I impact and how can I build and how can I get to do those things? But God said, hey, here's your plans. Well, here's, here's the plans I have for you. And I had to say yes. And the idea of what are those plans like? That you're living and this isn't because of me. It's not because I'm, I'm uh, educated. It's not because I've got the greatest uh, sermons. It's, not, it, it's simply because of him, not me. So the testimony of what you're even a part of here at Capstone isn't because I'm great. It's because he's great. And then when we submit to his plans and not our own plans, then we're a part of a plan that's way bigger than us. His plans are much more glorious than our plans. Because here's the thing, our plans are only as big as us. But when we step into his plans, they become eternal. And even the idea that we're trying to build this community center that a church meets in, and even that we're just trying to finish this, if it would start raining and be over 50 degrees for a little bit. But the idea, it's not going to happen on our, our strength, because we don't have enough people, we don't have enough money, but man, we, we set out for this God-sized thing, and man, the Lord's providing. But we've got to have the courage to step out of our plans and listen to His, because He gets the glory, not us. And so as we think about that, the testimony isn't based on how good we are, but how good He is. And so God may tell you to start a business, and man, it may be super successful, but it's because of Him, not of you. He may tell you to leave your current job, to go to another job, and you do amazing at it. Again, it's because of his plans, not yours. Or that, are you getting married? Or that whatever, those plans that you think, you go, man, you know what? I just want to submit to him. And you never know what God has in store. You never know, but his plans are much bigger and grander. And this idea that you don't take credit for it. You don't boast in yourself. And that's what James is saying. He's saying you're boasting in you, but you need to boast in him. Because if you're boasting in your plans, then it's not much to boast about. Because it pales in comparison to God's. So how are you living in such a way that you've got greater purpose, you're making a greater impact, and you're having a greater testimony, not because it's you, but because you're submitting to his plans. And just like Mary, she never knew the ride that she would be on. She never knew that we'd be talking about her thousands of years later. And you never know what God's going to do in and through you because you submit to his plans and not yours. So here's our big idea. It's pretty simple. It's this, is that Mary made room for Jesus by setting aside her plans and accepting the invitation to be the mother of Jesus. So she had a plan. She said, you know what? I'm going to cast it out the window because God's plan is better than mine. Doesn't mean it's easier. Doesn't mean you're going to be richer. Does it mean you're not going to get sick? Does it mean that you're going to be protected from, from the, the, the fiery arrows of the enemy? All of those are reality. Because so we look at history, that's the story of the disciples. That's the, that's the story of, of the, early, uh, the early church fathers and church mothers. And they went through hardship and difficulty and challenges. But yet we stand on their shoulders because of what they built. So this Christmas... The next four weeks, you begin to go, how can I make more room? Not for things, not for stuff, but for Jesus. 
Even as you think about January, as you get ready to come up, man, how can 2024 be more focused on he than me? How can I make room? How do I begin to create those habits? How do I, how do I live radically generous? How, how do I have that extra time so I can serve the least of these? How, how does that look in my life? Because I don't want it to be about me anymore. I want it to be about he. I need to make room. Because the truth is, we'll, we'll never have enough time. We'll never have enough stuff. We'll never have enough money. Because none of those things satisfy. Only he will. And so will you make room this Christmas for him? Will you make room for it to, be a, to, to have impact and have a testimony that's greater than yours? Begin to pray big prayers and say, all right, God, I'm willing to go where you want me to go. I'm willing to do what you want me to do. To begin to pray these prayers and, be, and just be honest. I'm going to be honest. I pray those prayers and here I stand. And I'm praying bigger prayers. I'm praying for Capstone and the impact we're going to have is, is more beyond even Fountain Inn. That I want Capstone to have a global impact. Not because we've got thousands and thousands of people here on Sunday morning. It's just because we've got faithful brothers and sisters who want to see the gospel go. So, so what, is, what, what do you need to make room for? So if you don't know Jesus, that's the first start. Like, hey, I'm, I'm just kind of here checking out church. I really don't know anything much about it. We would love to talk to you about what it means to make room in your life, to remove yourself on the throne of worship and put Jesus. So, so we'd love to have that conversation and point you to him. If you already are a Christ follower, begin to go, okay, what is it that I'm beginning to put my plans in front of his? Like, even if you've, I've given Jesus 90%, but there's 10% of still my plans of what I want. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. Either all in or all out. So what is it that we need to give? Maybe it's that last 10% that you need to give to him this Christmas. But how is it that we need to make room for him? Make room in our worship, in our family, in our marriage, our finances, our testimony, where you work on live and play, how do we make room for him that he's the center of the story, not us? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Mary and just her willingness to say yes. The invitation to be the mother of Jesus and despite her having her plans and despite her having all of her life kind of planned out, thinking that her life would never really, quote unquote, amount to much. Here we are talking about her faithfulness. And so, Lord, I pray that, that we too would live such a life. That we too would be used in such a way that lives are transformed because of our obedience. Not because of our goodness. Not because we're, we're, we're good people, but God, because we serve a, a good and holy Savior. So, Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you today, Lord, I pray that they would begin to make that step of faith to make room for you. They would remove themselves from that throne of worship and they would put you. Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are followers of you, I pray that you would begin to just speak to them. What is it for them in their next level of faith, in that next uh, step of maturity? What is it that they need to make room for? How is it they continue to become those disciples, those, those mature missionary disciples? What do they need to make room for? Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would just simply Simply speak and that we would have the courage to listen. And that in that, as we make room for you, that God, we would see the world around us transformed. Not because of our goodness, but because of your holiness. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen.